that we are children of God. That's where identity begins. And that's where peacefulness begins because we're not trying to gain some type of, of affirmation as to what our identity needs to be. And that helps us have a mentally healthy environment up here in our brain. Hey everyone, welcome to the Dr. Jeff Show podcast. As you know, this show is available on Apple, Google, Spotify, Christian platforms, Edify, Liftable, wherever you get your podcasts. Please, if you like the show, take a moment to review it on your favorite platform. That way more people will know about the interviews with these guests who are major thought leaders from many fields of influence showing how our worldview changes everything. My guest today oversees Focus on the Family's work to equip mothers and fathers with biblical principles for raising healthy, resilient children. He's a bilingual, licensed clinical social worker with a master's degree from the University of Denver Graduate School of Social Work and a doctorate in counseling practice. He addresses issues related to parenting, such as communication, conflict resolution, spiritual growth, discipline, anxiety, depression, media discernment, and healthy sexuality. Please welcome Dr. Danny Huerta to the show. Dr. Danny Huerta, welcome to the Dr. Jeff Show podcast. Dr. Jeff, thanks for having me on the show. Excited to be with you. Well, you do some amazing work at Focus on the Family, and you also have a private counseling practice. And you, and, uh, you are a summit dad. <laughs> two children who have graduated yeah. from the Summit Ministries two-week program. And they loved it, Jeff. I mean, they, they absolutely loved it. It was impactful. They still talk about it. They enjoyed the friendships, but also just the teaching. They enjoyed uh, each and every one of the different teachers and styles they brought to the, to the mix. So, it, yeah, thankful for it. Well, they were a great part of our class last summer. New group just came in for us. And mm -hmm. it's been, I was just with them today for the first, first bit. And, man, I'll tell you what. There is a noticeable rise in the level of anxiety, mm. depression, yeah. sense of aimlessness. Uh, and I think even more so than in previous years, students seem to be able to name what they are going through, or at least label it somehow. Mm. I don't know if they've actually had professional help on that or if they just, you know, watched a couple of TikTok videos and now they're an expert on it. <laughs> but they seem yeah. it's not only that people ex are having this baseline level of anxiety that's causing all these sorts of issues, but mm. that they're, but that now people are talking about it. We have, yeah. we have words for this now and it almost makes it seem like it's become people's identity to have the mm. problem. Is that something that you're, that's super Same. profound, Jeff. And yes, I have seen that, uh, the self-diagnosing, but also the, I mean, I was just talking to somebody recently, one of the, the a teenage guy, he said, it seems like you almost have to have a problem in order to fit in now. Yeah. You yeah. have to, in order to have a compelling, uh, something to say, it needs to be a story that is dark, that went through a ton of difficulty and you somehow overcame something in order to have a relevant story that people are going to be interested in or have any kind of uh, uh, desire to listen to. And so, yeah, I mean, yeah, there's some kids that are sometimes making up stories in order to fit in or uh, they are forcing some type of issue to bubble up in their life, some chaotic thing in order to have some type of compelling story. So it is interesting that you that you bring that up, this formation of identity is so loose in all kinds of different places. We see that in sexuality. We see that in this, in the mental health area. I mean, kids are grasping for this identity because of the age we live in with avatars and other things where you're, you're able to kind of define who you are and who, who you want to present to be in front of other people instead of just being you and allowing yourself to be loved the way you are. Yeah. And well, the show that we're doing today and folks who've traveled with the Dr. Jeff show podcast for a while know that for a while, we just, whatever topic was interesting in the news or whatever we did shows on it. And then this year we've tried to be more focused on a content calendar that matches everything else that we're doing at Summit Ministries. So May was mental health month. June is focus, a focus on identity. So the show we're doing right now bridges those two 
uh, together. And I, th- I think it's so perfect because in, in the counseling that you do, the work that you do supporting young adults and families at Focus on the Family really ties these two together. What? Hmm. But I, I want you to kick that off a little bit. You, if, okay. if you imagine that you're walking on a bridge from mental health awareness to identity, what is the relationship between those two? And how do we, you know, what, where should we root our identity? And what are some of the factors that go into that? Yeah, I mean, they go hand in hand in order to, it, it, in order to see good mental health, you see a solid, steadfast identity that isn't wavering according to what culture's saying or what other people say about you. We have a variety of people that say things to us throughout the day and give us nuggets as to how we're presenting who we are. And out of that, we gather just more more uh, news about how our behaviors are playing out, but it doesn't form who we are. Our performance doesn't do that either. Uh, we, we see the roles that we play and even our roles don't form our identity. Uh, our roles are dad and, you know, for you and I, Jeff, we're dads, we're, we're husbands, we're sons as well. I mean, there are all these roles and then we, we get to play a leadership role at our, at our uh, places of employment or mission where God has placed us. But in that we are children of God. Mm-hmm. That's where identity begins. And that's where peacefulness begins because we're not trying to gain some type of of affirmation as to what our identity needs to be. And that helps us have a mentally healthy environment up here in our brain. And uh, some people mix up mental illness with mental health. And they're two different things. And mental illness is where it's breaking down. The mental health is what we're building and intentionally maintaining in order to maintain a, a healthy uh, perspective on life, but also healthy relationships and a healthy rhythm as we're expressing this identity of who God created us to be. And uh, what an exciting opportunity to be a child of God, but many people have a hard time with that one. Yeah, uh, It's not enough. It's not enough to have that. We've got a show coming up a little bit later in the month uh, with a businessman who had a catastrophic business failure and lost billions of dollars. And he was a believer at the time, but then had to really learn what it meant to root his identity in Christ rather yeah. than in, wow. in his business success. So I'm looking forward to, to digging into that. Yeah. And, but I, so, so if I could summarize it here, mental health, we want to move toward being mentally healthy, significantly involved in that is recognize, recognizing our identity as a child of God. And then mentally healthy people then can have a clear identity, but people who have a clear identity then are also uh, moving in the direction of mental health. Is that fair? That is fair. And I, you know, what I, I picture, these are two of my favorite verses that I, I came across about two years ago. And it's just, it's transformed my thinking of what my everyday is like to be a child of God. And that's John 7, 37 and 38, where Jesus, this is one of the times where he stands up and he says, whoever's thirsty, come to me. And we know that we all have core human thirst. And so he addresses that, hey, whoever's thirsty, come to me. And, and then after that, he says, Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures have said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And I love that because it's it's saying if I believe that I'm a child of God, I have the potential to have this this river of flowing life coming out of me. And I remember when my daughter asked me, she goes, Dad, where does the river get their water, get get its water? Because it just it keeps flowing and I don't see a a place where there's water just flowing. How does it get its water? And I said, I don't know. It's, it's really cool. All the rain, all the snow melt, and that's all I know. But it just, it is a lot of water that's flowing there. And I picture that. That is our potential. And she wrote to me, Jeff, just recently in my in our little journal that we have on our kitchen table. We all get to write kind of some life-giving notes to each other. And she wrote this to me. She, she said, hey, remember this verse, Dad. Uh, it says, she, she picked this verse for me that day. It says, P, uh, my peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives, do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. John 14, 27. We had just been talking about peacefulness in our mind, even when there's chaos. How can that happen? 
because our safety is, is, is in question and a mentally healthy person will be able to see beyond the chaos from a different perspective, but will still have a sense of little can nervousness, anxiety, sadness. Those are all normal reactions emotionally. But the mental health is being able to recognize, having awareness of that, a healthy response to it, and then a steadfastness according to truth. Mm. That's where mentally healthy, a mentally healthy person is, and that starts that that identity in Christ, that trust. Yeah, I'm I'm starting to see uh, as we talk more and more about mental health at, at Summit. What's a biblical worldview of mental health? How do we stay healthy? How do we help our students who are struggling? I'm starting to see much more of a spiritual nature to it. it you know, the nature of even God's creation. We had a guest, David Nekrutman, who's Orthodox Jewish. And talking about Genesis chapter one, and he said, you know, Genesis chapter one, the, the opening word of scripture, Bereshit, uh, it doesn't just mean in the beginning. It, it, it means in the beginning of the beginning, God created stillness. Like the, the God created Sabbath. His, his last act of creation, David said, was his first intention. And I, it's, so I'm seeing a tie-in between the, the scripture that your daughter left for you, which is so beautiful, and God's very intention through creation that, of course, there's going to be motion. Of course, there's going to be activity. But who's interpreting that for you? Mm. Is it Jesus yeah. who is giving you the message of what that means? Or is it Satan who's giving you the message of what that means? Right, right. Yeah, that's so so key. And in Genesis, man, that's fantastic, Jeff. I love that. And in Genesis, what strikes me there, I've been thinking about the word let and thinking about how that goes with uh, with mental health, what we let uh, ruminate in our minds, what we let come into our minds, what we let ourselves do, where, where we let ourselves go, if we let Christ ruin our hearts. And in the beginning, that creation time, it, it uses the word let, you know, he mm. let things, certain things happen. And then we see the, the creation of the new self in Colossians 3, and it talks about let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. And then it says, uh, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Yeah. And it's, but it's your letting, but first you're putting on something. Mm. And that's that identity. I'm putting on this new self. I'm putting on something and then I'm letting something happen out of that flow. And that's creation, the creation story. He lets something happen and momentum flows from there. So it's interesting that you brought that up, that Genesis 1. Yeah, man. Well, I, I love all of, uh, I love the constant flow of scripture from beginning to end, how it's so coherent. And, yeah. you know, I think some people think we're pretty weird for talking about spiritual warfare. We don't do that a lot on this on this show but there absolutely is something that's gone haywire and it does yep. seem intentional. It does seem like there's, mm, you know, there's malice behind it. It isn't just an accident. It isn't just a woundedness. I don't know when you're, when you're counseling with people and, and I know you can't reveal specific situations, but do you, do you sense that it's like an, an yes. oppression or something that takes place? There's, there's a blindness that comes that can only be explained by spiritual, spiritual warfare. And uh, I've talked to a few guys about this. I mean, I remember one particular person a long time ago that came in and said, I, I, I really would love to eat Christians. And he knew I was a Christian therapist. That was an interesting moment. I, I knew I was not dealing with a person. I was dealing with a spiritual moment there, mm. spiritual warfare. It was just an evil moment. I would pray up so much before those sessions, and it was it was incredible to see the transformation in this uh, this individual to the point of 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 not wanting that and wanting life and completely changing their 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 view. You could see there was a releasing of freeing from these spirits that were holding this person down. They were blinded in that moment. You could see the, the just the oppressiveness, and slowly as they were letting th certain things go. 
and 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 aware of their um, the the brokenness in there, it started to release some of these these. Uh, th- these tie-ins spiritually that mm. uh, we're harming them. But yeah, I would agree with you, Jeff. There's, even if, if people think we're weird, it, it really, it, a lot of the things that, that are being talked about in, in media with over a hundred genders or uh, not seeing a, a baby as, as a baby in the womb, but until they're, they're out and they, it's not considered murder, but then you can't kill a, like, like an animal, you can't hurt an animal, but, but here's a, this baby, this human being, and, and you can completely basically torture it as, as uh, this, this child as they're in the womb where the safest place on earth, it should be the safest place on yeah. earth. Yet, yet there's this, this, this weird, uh, place there where there's a defending of something that absolutely does not make sense. Only can it, it, it can only live within our society because of spiritual warfare. Mm. That's it. Mm. Wow. Well, I think this is really helpful. I, I mean, most people I know who aren't believers still believe that evil is real. They yeah. just don't know where to place it. They, they feel like it's kind of like fate or it's accidental, mm. but scripture assures us that it's a battle and that we're fighting it and that the battle isn't just physical, but it's something, it's something more. Well, yeah. And Jeff, yeah. Jeff on that, I just, one of the interesting things here that uh, as we're talking about a battle, we're, we're supposedly, we've, we've created um, social media and technology and phones. All these creations we've created are supposed to make life better, are supposed to, uh, cre- create uh, a life that's easier, that's simpler, but we're we're inundated by entertainment now. Yet we're the loneliest generation, really, on record. Hmm. There's a lot of emptiness, and there's sleep deprivation on top of that. It hasn't made things easier, and it hasn't improved mental health. It has made us more entertained, busier, emptier, more disconnected. And it's fascinating to consider that because it's not stopping. And as, as parents, as Christians, we just need to be aware of what are we going to let happen and how do we maintain healthiness in a place that is, that, that is not going towards a healthy momentum just naturally. Hmm. Well, I appreciate you're going there with me. Uh, it's, it's, it's tough. And I, I have some people who just kind of look at me and roll their eyes like, oh, you're one of those. <laughs> but, but there, but we've got to, we've got to bring up what the experience of people really is. Uh, we know that, that evil eats away at what is good. It's like a cancer and it's, it's ongoing. Mm. And, uh, what I'd really like to do in the time that we have is, is focus in on some of the, some of the aspects of identity, maybe, maybe a building or protecting identity. And, Mm -hmm. you know, a few years ago, uh, you, you wrote, you wrote this book called seven traits of effective parenting. How, 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 when, when was that, when did that book come out? Uh, that was 2019. Okay. 2019. So, so four years ago, well, um, and I was trying to review with you the, uh, the traits ahead of the show, Mm -hmm. because I could only think of six of them and it always (laughs) bugs me. It's like, there's a list of seven and I can't think of seven. Yeah. Like phone number. yeah. <laughs> but the seventh one is one that I really want our show to land on today. Cause I, it's so, so critical, mm-hmm. but you, these traits of effective parenting actually relate very strongly to how we cultivate and nurture our identity as children of God. Yeah. And so I wanted to maybe dive into them a little bit. Maybe maybe this can be some practical help for people who are saying, okay, sure, great, I get it. I want to have my identity in Christ. Uh, but how on earth do I actually do that? What does that actually mean? That's excellent. And so yeah, it, I see the relationship between, between some of these, um, and I wonder if we could just chat through some of them. 
I would love to. And, and they're divided into three segments. And in the book, I didn't do that. Uh, this was kind of discovery after post post writing the book. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, I hate yeah, that. You know, I hate that when that happens. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But it's, the first two, adaptability and respect, are about the invitation. Hmm. We have we have invitations all around us. We have the grand invitation of Jesus saying, "Hey, you're my child. Come to me, right? That come to me if you're thirsty." That invitation is all around. Every day we're having those. Adaptability is adapting to those invitations we've got and adapting to the world around us and what's happening, the things we don't have control over. As parents, the first ones that are real obvious are sleep deprivation and diapers that just come at you out of nowhere. And you're like, oh my goodness, how am I going to do all this? And emotions that are spilling out of your kids. And then you have respect. Respect is is the second one is, is what's happening inside of me, my emotions. You were talking about people being much more aware of how they're feeling and we're in, in a generation that's very aware of their emotions. But then it's what do you do with those? How do you show up to the invitation with that? And with with uh, within the research that I did on these seven traits, I looked for the balance of being having warmth and having boundaries, hmm. having warmth and having boundaries. We need both. We need to be warm, loving people, and we need to be people that are not afraid to have boundaries and limits that are steadfast, that are based on truth, that in high levels of both of those. And the goal in this research was interesting, Jeff, is as I talked to the chair, uh, you know, the, uh, on the committee, the, uh, the doctoral committee, he was not a Christian. And I said, on these seven traits, what I'm wanting to show is that if, if parents practice these seven, they will raise a contributor rather than a consumer. Wow. And many times the behaviors look the same. And he said, hey, tell me more, because, you know, you can't do the Christian thing and, you know, in this defense, yeah. but I want to know more. And when we talked about the way that we manipulate one another within our behaviors, many times there's a transaction in the invitation. When we show up to that invitation, many times we're looking for a transaction. I said, that leaves people completely empty because we're just consuming constantly. And that was not how we were originally designed as people in our identity. That's just something we've learned over time that gives us little juice squirts. Mm. But we were designed to be contributors, and that's when we fulfill our mission and our purpose. And many times we approach our invitation with these behaviors either to manipulate or to serve. One fills, the other one leaves you thirsty. And so uh, he said, well, that's interesting. So he, he, he initially disagreed with the whole Christian thing and all that. But then he at the at the defense after we were all done, he said, Danny, just want to tell you, I'm using this contributor consumer thing with my with my teenage son, uh, sons and my college son, because it makes absolute sense. That's where you find a true, deep, deep seated satisfaction when you truly care about someone beyond yourself. Hmm. And you contribute to something. And so these seven traits, you go from adaptability to respect. That's your invitation. And then out of that, you create a momentum. The next three are all about momentum. And we're surrounded by momentums all over. But intentionality defines what momentum you're wanting to create yeah. in response to all that. And then it goes into steadfast love in which y your love is not... Uh, it's not conditional. It's a love that you're saying. It's steadfast. I love you because you're you. And then you go into boundaries and limits because that's that's very loving. Those three combined, those momentums lead a person into steadfastness. And those are those last two: grace and forgiveness and gratitude. So, so the so you so we have invitation, then momentum, and then steadfastness. Steadfastness. Yes. So, yeah. You know what I love about this? I guess up until this moment, when I think about identity, and I think about having my identity in Christ, I think that that is a relatively static thing. Like yeah. my identity is in him or it isn't. But what you're talking about is there's there's movement involved. That, yes. that we're we're moving in a particular direction. And that identity isn't something where it's just, you know, a be still and know that I'm God. It is you know, it is me accepting the invitation, uh, keeping, continuing to move in the direction that God wants me to go and then, and being faithful with it. Yes, that's yeah. correct.
yeah. I, I love this show because I get to learn. Um, <laughs> but um, I just think that's really that's really powerful. So when we so when you picture identity, having your identity in Christ, you want to picture something that's dynamic, not static. Right. So, like so, that river. Y- y- like the river. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about the f- gratefulness. Uh, because I'd, I'd be curious in the research that that was the final, that was the final, that was the seventh one that I was missing. Isn't it? That was the seventh gra- one. Gratitude. Yeah. yeah. yeah gratitude. Right. Uh, right. So I remember I met a guy named Mike Zigarelli many years ago and he did a big study. People could, mm. they, he didn't select the participants. So the results are limited, but he also had like 60,000 people take it. So it, it was interesting. He found that gratitude was the character quality that was lacking among the believers who took the survey the most. Interesting. Interesting. And I'm just curious what you found as you were talking through that. It does, it does seem like if you're accepting the invitation, you're actually saying yes to what God's giving you, trusting him that whether it's hard or whether it's easy, whether it's fun or whether it's not, that it, it's mm. something that by accepting it, we become an altogether different sort of person. Man, the gratitude is recognizing what we're given without having uh, a, an entitlement hmm. to whatever we're given. And uh, it, it really requires a mindset, like you're setting a mind in a direction. My daughter, I remember uh, her putting a uh, it was a cardboard cutout, uh, just, she put on their gratitude and put it above her bed. And, uh, she had been reading the book by Ann Voskamp, a thousand blessings, I believe. And, uh, she said, dad, I'm going to write her favorite numbers, 1,085. So she said, I'm going to write 1,085 things, different things that I'm thankful for. And, uh, and I said, Hey, let me join you. Can we do that together? So she put it above her bed was, I mean, she was writing different things. It, it really gets hard past 200 <laughs> to figure out, did I already write that? Did I not write it? I, I don't know. I can't remember. And so you're going through it, trying to find that. But then we ended up putting one right by at our garage, our garage door on the way out because of the idea of setting our mind towards that, this idea that we have a gift. The day's a gift that we're unwrapping. It's never been lived in. We're getting to unwrap it. Are we a gift? Are we being present with what God's doing and what he's uh, giving us to do in that day? And are we are we a present to other people by being present uh, with them? And that's that gratitude, this idea that I'm receiving. I've received what I need. Now I get to give. And it's truly a mindset so hard. Our minds naturally go to consuming and uh, safety and uh, self-protection, insecurity, all kinds of things that that lead us away from gratitude towards a self-protective place, just like the garden, the Garden of Eden. You're talking about the the beginning. When you have anxiety, you go towards self-protection. It just naturally does that. When you have anxiety, you go towards away from adaptability towards a more rigid mindset of needing safety. Hmm. What's what's fascinating with the research, Chef, what I found is if you practice gratitude, it makes you more adaptive. Hmm. If you're more adaptive, it makes you more respectful. If you're more respectful and adaptive, you become more intentional and and focused because there aren't things wavering. Your, Your emotions are under control, so you're able to see clearly. Once you have those three and you're being intentional and you understand who you love and why you love them, you can be steadfast in your love. And if you do those, you've created an environment where you can actually have boundaries, where you can put chore lists, you can put, uh, you can say no to people without needing their love in return. You're wanting it and you're wanting to be loving, but boundaries are very honest and they're very helpful in, in helping create a healthy relationship. And in that, then now you can have grace and forgiveness because you've created trust all along the way. And, and after you have grace and forgiveness in those things, you can say, man, this is, this is a rich life. I've got a lot here. And you create gratitude, which creates adaptability. And now you've created this self-sustaining seven traits 
that help address the five dimensions dimensions of mental health. And I don't know if you want me to go into those. Oh five yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, this is this is so interesting. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. All right. So the first one is that spiritual component. That's the foundation to our mental health. Research shows it over and over again that spiritually, if there's a core belief that truly does create a healthier mental health, less depression, less anxiety. Then the other dimension is the emotional world. A person that is not right emotionally is becomes unhealthy fast in the in the other areas of, of mental health. So emo, an emotional world in your home and in your relationships, being able to have a very expanded emotional vocabulary, as you were talking about mm -hmm. the, the people being, that is very helpful. Then the third one is mental, your thought bubbles. Do you reach for the better thought or do you just reach for the easiest one? Wow. Do you look at all the thoughts that you could have, all the thought bubbles you've got, the thought bubbles other people have, and you, you, you grasp towards truth, towards that highest level thought that you're like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work so hard to get that one because it's the healthiest one. And then from there, the physical health of a person, are they eating well, sleeping well, are they exercising? Those are all very practical things to help with, with mental health. Uh, they seem, they seem easy, but a lot of people struggle with those. And then, uh, and then the final one is relational health. Do I invest in relationships with people? Do I maintain the relationships I've got in those five dimensions? are good markers to look at. How am I doing in each of these five areas? Am I balanced in those five? Or am I working out five hours and I'm not spending time with anyone? Uh, I'm, I'm not really thinking through what I'm thinking about. You know, that's that gives you a picture of not being balanced in the five areas of mental health. And the seven traits help you with uh, with those five areas of, of mental health. Yeah. So it's interesting. So, so you have emotional uh, yeah. or the, and mental um spiritual spiritual spir oh, sorry spiritual you did first then emotional then mental then physical then relational right so those yeah. those five yeah well this is really helping us flesh out an understanding of what, what it actually means what, what what does it look like to have your identity in christ you're mm -hmm. confident in him you have no uh, you, you you know that you're made in the image of a loving God. You know that he is for you. You know that whatever happens, uh, he has, Jesus has overcome the world. Yeah. But then in daily habits, there are certain things that we're cultivating. Mm. Uh, so it, talk just yeah. briefly about the uh, cultivating each aspect, each one of those aspects, this, the, the spiritual uh, the emotional, the mental, the physical, and the relational. Do, in your life, do you do you kind of think about those every day and think, okay, I want to be sure I'm I'm focused on this, or is it just sort of coming up situationally? No, I try. I mean, because it is it is truly we're we're a multi dimensional person. A, a, a human being is multi dimensional, right? So we have a lot of aspects of who we are, and the spiritual aspect is the ones that. that uh, is is most neglected by people because it's it's uh, th there's least pressure to do it uh, and and it's it's uh, it's not as threatening on the outside to your to your identity right uh, yet it's one of the most important so prayer time that's very private uh, having that conversation with God that some people say man I feel like I'm crazy talking to somebody I'm not seeing but it's really when you believe I'm a child of God and I get to do this, this is amazing you're right yeah. then it changes that feeling it, reading scripture and getting those truths uh, going to uh, a, a group like a church or other places where you're you're receiving other truths that are trustworthy around the interpret uh, interpretation of scripture and the encouragement that in itself gives a real practical um, balancing. So if I don't go to church for multiple weeks or I'm not praying or I'm not reading scripture, there's an offness I feel there. Then emotionally we can all tell when we're off emotionally. Yeah. I mean, I, I can tell, right? I wake up or I'm in a place and I go, man, I'm just, I'm not on, man. What's going on? What, what, what momentum's happening inside of me? Is it something here? Did it come from somewhere else? And it makes us aware 
of that. And it's, it's so important for us to realize where our emotions are at and how we can be either toxic or life-giving according to what, how we're going for a ride with those. So usually I'd like to have on one of my water bottles, I've got an emotions wheel. Hmm. And sometimes I'll ask my kids, Hey, where are you at here? Besides mad and all that, tell me, <laughs> tell me deeper words. Let's go deeper. Right. <laughs> and, uh, so with the thought piece, uh, I love to, Think about what the themes are of my thoughts. Where have my thoughts been? If I'm starting to feel anxious or I feel down, I go, what What am I seeing that right now I'm not thinking about? Yeah. Because my emotions are telling me something. And uh, with my son and daughter, just in guiding them, I'll say, hey, let me in on your thought bubbles. What's going on in there? You've shared just a few, but I know there's more. I see something on the outside and I go, there's something in the thought bubbles that I wish you would share. Can we go in there a little bit together? And I love to do that also with my wife uh, and, and have opened the door for them to do that with me. Not protecting thoughts, but allowing for them to say, hey, honey, you've been, you've been a little off. What, are you, what have you been thinking about? What's going on there? Um, and, and having that vocabulary, their thoughts truly do begin to influence our behaviors. And then on the physical side, I, I, man, I try to go to bed early when I can, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't mm -hmm. always happen. And I know I pay for it the next day. The party's a little harder the next day on my, in my brain, right? Yeah. It's, it didn't, I didn't give it time to clean up in there. And then, uh, and then if, if I'm, if I'm not eating right, or I didn't exercise, exercise makes a huge difference on the proteins and the, the metabolism of the brain and how it's going to function. And I noticed the difference in that. And my son and I were talking about that. I said, Hey, do you notice when, when you don't work out for a while, just do, do you notice your, your attitude, different things changing? I was, yeah, man, it's, it's, it's very interesting. It doesn't even have to be a long workout. It can be a 10 minute workout and it makes a difference in your brain. It's, it's, it's really cool. And, uh, where I choose to go, where I choose to spend my time, if I'm being productive or I'm resting or I'm being present with my family, physically where I'm choosing to be makes a difference. And I've noticed times when I go, ah, I'm just, maybe if I waste time here, it feels very different than if I was fully in conversation with one of my kids. I feel so, uh, it feels like a contribution there. And I, I feel productive, right? Doing that or serving my family, washing dishes or, or going for a walk with my kids. Physically, what I do with that time that I was given. And then the, the last one is that relational component. Where have I invested my relational opportunities, all my inv invitations. Have I been aware of those? Have I been a relational person, even to the stranger, like at the, at the store or at a restaurant? How have I navigated the invitations I've been given? And I notice if I don't do all these other dimensions well, that last one, the relational dimension suffers. And that's where I'm seeing a lot of people are very lonely because all these other things are being taken for a ride. Uh, and, uh, here's, here's an interesting quote for you, Jeff, on that. It says, uh, I pulled it out for, for, to, to share with you. It says, um, it says this, it says, our, our, the greatest power a person possesses is the power to choose. Mm -hmm. I wonder if we're really mm -hmm. choosing or if many things are being chosen for us. Mm -hmm. You know what, the word that you used in describing each one of those five things and some of the daily habits was notice yeah. that you're noticing things you you are you are aware of yourself and your environment at a higher level and and that awareness then that that noticing allows you to self correct right so so when we talk about having your identity in Christ we aren't I love scripture memory, but it's not about memorizing, memorizing 500 verses. No. You know, I, I love getting time alone to just be with the Lord, but it's not about moving to a monastery. You know, right? <laughs> no, it is right. in everyday circumstances. Am I just asking God, make me aware, just make me aware of these yeah. situations. Uh, are these needs being met? Am I taking responsibility in these areas? And then how does that affect the people around me? Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's interesting. One of the exercises on the, the seven traits that I do a lot with, with families in my practice is 
notice what what emotion you feel just look i usually give them a list of emotions and then what you choose to do hmm. a lot of people say well you made me mad so i did this well no you, you chose to do something according to an emotion you felt where did that come from what would you choose to do differently hmm. now that you've paused and looked you know been able to look at the the, the situation so that you guard that relational component of your mental health well so yeah. you you're a good steward of that. And uh, it's so easy for, uh, for our imperfections to spill out. And uh, what I tell my kids, Jeff, in that is I'm giving you an opportunity to practice love truly, right? The, the, <laughs> you, you get to practice the fruit of the spirit when my imperfections spill out. And I get to practice <laughs> that as well when yours spill out. So, yeah. Well, so that's really great. Do. Well, I, it was a, it was a pleasure to meet your kids. Um, you know, they're, so they're, they're active, they're involved in, you know, athletics and in, uh, the physical science and some, and some of those kinds of things. So I'm sure, I'm sure, uh, the exercise aspect of what you guys do as a family, uh, it, it comes naturally. I, I think it doesn't for a lot of people. I think, I think a lot of people are going to have, uh, who are watching or listening to this, each one of us probably finds a specific challenge, the mm. spiritual you know, really growing spiritually, emotionally, mentally, physically, relationally. If you've got a challenge in one of those areas, just, you know, think of them, make a little wheel of, you know, how do I think I'm doing in, in each one of these areas? And what can I do? What can I do differently? I didn't do it very well today. What can I do tomorrow? Mm, that's good. I love that. And Jeff, in that, putting at the center a child of God, and what roles do I play out? throughout my day within these five dimensions and how do I show up to that invitation? Mm, what momentums yes. are around me? And then how can I be steadfast, either in my relationships, my beliefs, because that, that creates a peacefulness that we're, we're all searching for. I mean, the, we're all super thirsty and insecure, Jeff, every, every mm. single one of us around us. And some people hide it better than others, but in that, do we find that security, and that 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 sad that that thirst satisfaction in being a child of Christ, and that's where it can begin, and then there can be that river flowing out. So, yeah, people get, get very creative in drawing that out. I love how you said it. Put the wheel out, kind of measure where you're at, and each of us, all of us, struggle in different areas. This isn't about perfection; it's about the awareness, like you pulled that out, the noticing of what's going on. Yeah. Well, Danny, this has been a fun conversation. I see more clearly the tie between mental health and identity, more clearly in a very practical way, what it means to have a dynamic understanding of my identity in Christ. And uh, just the way you've, you've shared today uh, just gives me a sense of peace and confidence that this is doable. This is something that I, that I can help with, that can help me in my life practices and also be able to help others. So thanks for your investment of time. Thank you so much, Jeff. Thanks for having me on the show. Appreciate it. Thank you to my guest today, Dr. Danny Huerta, for coming on the show. We talked about the intersection of mental health and identity. And the principles that we talked about are practical and ambitious in the sense that they give us something to strive toward. And that's what, we're, that's what we're trying to do. Scripture says that we press on to the high calling of Christ. Having our identity in Christ is not a static reality. It's a dynamic reality. So let's take our calling seriously, especially as we think about preparing the next generation. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week. Listeners, I want you to know that our podcast is on Edify, which is a truly powerful app that brings together thousands of the best Christian podcasts in one place for your listening enjoyment. You can download it at edify, E-D-I-F-I dot app. Be sure to share this show if you have enjoyed listening to it and leave a review if you would on the site where you download the show. That helps more people know about the Dr. Jeff Show, and I'll look forward to seeing you next week.